There's an interesting scene in the movie Schindler's List where a group of people, um, Jewish Poles, are herded into the ghetto, and I'm not sure if it's in Warsaw, but it's some fair-sized Polish town. And they have a short conversation with each other about, well, huh, imagine that. Our grandparents uh, would be surprised to see that they were released from the ghetto, and here we are being stuffed back into it. Um, you know, and one of the guys says, well... Okay, so we're here. It's nothing that Jewish people haven't had to endure before, and, you know, we, we managed to deal with it. It's not nice when a gang of thugs break in and smash up the streets and beat a few people up, but, you know, <laughs> that's, that's our history. It's the way it always is. We have to face that. It's probably all the, the way that it's always going to be. It's not so bad, is it? Um, sort of, I, I wouldn't say that that's looking on the bright side, but it is sort of a an expression of amor fati, because it's sort of saying that, all right, we all have our sack of rocks to carry around, and being Jewish, this is ours. We're constantly restricted and harassed and persecuted in individual ways that can be pretty horrible, but as a people, we manage somehow. We always have. Um, <laughs> it's interesting that he can't see the future when he says this. He doesn't know what's coming, say, six months down the road. <laughs> six months down the road, um, things are going to get an awful lot worse. You won't just be in the ghetto anymore. You'll, you'll be in cattle cars being sent off to Auschwitz. And I'm sure that people who were herded into the camps, a little bit more frightened than they were when they were herded into the ghetto, um, a little more angry, I guess, maybe, but also, well, all right, now we've hit rock bottom. Now it's as bad as it's going to get. Now we're in these friggin' camps. It gets worse, even in the camps. Um, it gets worse than short rations. Um, you know, it gets worse than brutal beatings by the bar, bar guards, rather. Um, that's the thing about the Shoah, right? Uh, every step along the way, things got progressively worse and worse. And I guess at every step along the way, somebody could say what the guy said when they were forced into the ghetto. Well, all right. It could be worse. Life can still continue, even under these restricted conditions that have gotten worse. Um, now, that is an interesting challenge, I guess, to the idea of amor fati. You think that you've accepted your fate and you've, um, you've learned to love it. Then it gets radically worse. <laughs> um, you think that you've hit rock bottom, but you haven't even come close. You're still in pretty shallow waters here. Um... But every step of the way, as it happens, somebody is going to say, okay, so it got worse, now what? Let's say that we think that that's a silly attitude, the idea of making the most of it, no matter how bad things are. Would it have made any difference, even if the guy knew what was coming? The sheer inexorability of the mechanics of genocide that the Nazis perfected in the 1940s um, almost make any attempt at resistance by a Jewish inhabitant of East Central Europe or Europe in general seem puny and utterly futile. Um, the Holocaust was so well planned and so well executed, interesting, eh? um, that it just seems to have been utterly inexorable for the people that were swept up in it. You look at that and you sort of say, what if you were a Jewish person swept up in all this? Is there anything that you could have done to save yourself or to prevent it from happening to everybody or whatever? Um, I think I know what most people think in the modern world about the Holocaust. It, it's the ultimate case of a helpless victim, and I tend to agree. Uh, I don't think that there's anything anybody could have done about it, at least in terms of the people who were swept up in it. Uh, the people who were outside of it, i.e. all the non-Jewish populations of East Central Europe and the world in general, I guess, I'm not letting anybody off the hook there, um, they could have done something about it. Many people did. A few people in, say, the Warsaw Ghetto, when they rebelled, when, uh, in a sort of hopeless situation, but they still rebelled, um, they were still killed and they, their rebellion was useless. Um, 
although I suppose some of the people, when they were being lined up to be shot after the uh, ghetto was crushed, uh, the ghetto rising was crushed, they probably went, well, this is better than letting the, one of these bastards herd me into the gas chamber. At least I killed a couple of them. You know, like I was saying in the previous video about the guy who's been sunk by a U-boat. You know, that's sort of the Western equivalent of Auschwitz. That's the horrible death, the horrible, silent, inexorable death out there in the darkness that's going to get you. It's a big thing in Canadian war literature because the Canadian Navy was one of the major players until the Americans were involved in crossing the Atlantic uh, with the wolf packs out there hunting them. Um, a lot of Canadian families have stories of sailors who had to deal with all of that. But, you know, you get sunk. You know you're being watched by the U-boat because they tended to put a searchlight on you uh, as the boat was sinking to watch you sink if it was in the middle of the night, and it usually was. So at least as you go down, you get to go, you know, all right, you got me, I'm dying. Fuck you anyway. Um, the people who participated in the Warsaw Uprising got to do that as well in many ways. Uh, they at least got to kill a few of the people that were going to kill them. Um, was that an accomplishment? That's a philosophical question, I suppose. But it says something about Amor Fati, right? Um, okay, maybe I can't really control a lot about my fate here, but I can at least show them that humans have dignity even under the most hopeless circumstances. I can at least demonstrate to myself that I have dignity, that I haven't fallen to pieces even under impossible possible circumstances. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, in, in Israel, the story of Masada is often told that way, but I'm, I understand that uh, Israelis are sort of starting to rethink that because the idea of mass suicide might not be the <laughs> model that they want to follow, but it's, it's the same idea, though. Um, you might kill us all, but we're going to die with dignity. We're going to die with smiles on our faces in a weird kind of way. We're going to die on our own terms, at least our own terms within the context of what is possible and what is not possible. We know you're going to kill us. It's just a question of how we're going to die. Um, what's the option? What's the, what's the alternative to Amor Fati in a circumstance like Auschwitz or Masada or a U-boat attack or something like that? Screaming and yelling as you die? <laughs> um, living in a state of abject, paralyzed horror? Um... You know, is that really a, a preferable alternative when something is utterly inevitable? Um, do you really want to make that choice as opposed to at least, you know, going down fighting? Or at least saying, well, I did my best, <laughs> you know. The inevitable has come upon me. What can I do? The wave the size of, you know, a skyscraper is about to hit me. I think it was the movie Armageddon or something that that happened in. And there's just, there's nothing for me to do. I have a split second to decide what I'm going to do in the last moment of my life, and can I go, holy shit, this is, uh, this is quite a way to die, isn't this? You know, this is profound. Or, oh my god, oh no, 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 you know, <laughs> take your pick. You have your choice, ultimately. The question is, does that have value? Does it make any difference uh, in terms of your own life, your own existence, you yourself. Not in terms of what people should do, not in terms of some sort of belief in this is how you, you know, this is how people should actually react to things that are terrible or inevitable or beyond terrible. Um, it's just put yourself in that situation. As I say, I'm not proselytizing for Amor Fati here. I'm simply explaining Amor Fati from the perspective of an individual who has been caught up in events that are beyond his control or her control and are so horrible as to be, in many ways, unfaceable. Um, what do you do in that case? Um, you know, do you do what that guy did in the ghetto and say, well, it could be worse. You know, our ancestors lived in ghettos for thousands of years. They had to deal with, you know, persecutions and occasional mass killings. Um, but life went on, and it was perfectly possible to have a viable and enjoyable Jewish life in Poland in the Middle Ages, if you were lucky and you kept your wits about you, and, um, you know, it wasn't the end of the world. Individuals may end up in terrible circumstances, but, you know, that's, that's life, isn't it? 
Um, but of course, again, we knew what was coming, and uh, you know, it's interesting to imagine what Spielberg meant when he put that scene in the in the movie. Was he trying to say what an idiot this guy is for sort of poo-pooing the fact that they'd been forced into the ghetto, or was he simply saying that there it is at least possible to sort of see that kind of adversity as something of a I won't say a triumph, but you know, at least something you can live with, you yourself as an individual. We'll say that, okay, so it's maybe easy enough, or I shouldn't say easy enough, but it's not all that unimaginable to think, okay, I've been stuffed into the ghetto here, and that's as bad as it's going to get, and I'm probably going to live in poverty and humiliation and, you know, persecution for most of my life, but, you know, we as Jewish people will get on as we always have. Um, well, I know you're not going to get on as you always have, because something else is coming. But let's say that at every step along the way, as the screws got tighter and tighter on the people who were being slowly and inexorably um, channeled into the gas chambers, is it possible, I, won't say, I want to ask if it's easy or sane as usual, but is it possible to love your fate every step along the way, up to and including the moment that the Cyclone B comes out of the shower heads? Um... The Holocaust is, you know, very an apt tool for this kind of musing. Is there a way to overcome that as an individual, not as a doctrine or something that you would encourage anyone else to follow, but you as an individual in the canvas of your own life in terms of the inevitability of that which must happen and things that you simply cannot control, is there any way, or is there a preferable way to face that? Um, I think you know, again, what my answer is. 